This video is brought to you by my fantastic supporters over at Patreon. Go to patreon.com slash tjtheemperor to find out how you can support the channel. In 1992, Quintet released their sophomore work, the action RPG Soul Blazer. The game was accessible yet philosophically sophisticated, and became another triumph for the young studio, who quickly began to work on a follow-up. 1993 would prove to be their most prolific year to date, with two games being released within a month of one another. To start with the first one, remember how in my Soul Blazer video I mentioned how it would have been easy after the success of ActRaiser to just do a follow-up to that game? Well, it turns out, that's exactly what they ended up doing here. ActRaiser 2, released in October of 1993, is, as the name suggests, a follow-up to ActRaiser. Now, despite what I said a paragraph ago, I'm not going to take Quintet to task for taking the easy way out, as it actually wasn't their idea to make the game at all. The idea for ActRaiser 2 actually came from Enix of America, specifically from producer Robert Geralt. According to Geralt, at the time, he was under the impression that American fans wanted two things, action and challenge. To that end, he requested an ActRaiser game that was both difficult and, most critically, that did away with the god sim elements from the original. ActRaiser 2 was the result. I am, admittedly, not going to spend a lot of time discussing ActRaiser 2, as it, of all Quintet's games, least warrants an in-depth discussion. For one thing, the story is entirely bare-bones, merely serving as an excuse for the action stages contained therein. Tanzer was defeated by the Master, and in revenge, his mightiest minions, the Chosen Thirteen, have not only resurrected him, but invaded your world. To stop him, the Master must once again come down from his Sky Palace and defeat them, which in this case means fighting your way through seven stages that are all themed after one of the seven deadly sins. If you're wondering where this story is supposed to take place in relation to the original ActRaiser, the answer is kind of nowhere. Despite being called ActRaiser 2, it's better to think of this game as a reimagining of the original ActRaiser story, as there's no easy way to make the two games fit together. The world is designed entirely differently, and the same basic plot beats happen again without any reference to it happening before. To be fair though, this isn't a game that places much weight on its story, so we shouldn't either. If Enix of America wanted a game that emphasized action and challenge, then Quintet more than delivered. ActRaiser 2 is, without question, one of the most difficult games on the SNES. Far from the fair challenge offered by the first game, the second seems to go out of its way to punish you. Your character moves at a slow, lumbering pace, making every step you take feel extra weighty. Instead of one basic swing of your sword, you can now attack in multiple directions, which requires you to more closely consider enemy placement. The most drastic changes, however, can be found in both magic and jumping. I'll start with magic. Instead of choosing a spell before you begin a level, you technically have access to every spell throughout the entire game. To use them, you hold down X or Y until you turn red, and then, depending on what action your character performs, the spell cast will be different. It's an interesting system, but one that serves to make the game even more difficult than it already is. The multi-step spellcasting process is perhaps not the easiest thing to successfully pull off when you're in the midst of a stressful boss fight. As for jumping, because your character now has wings, aside from a standard jump, you can also double jump, glide slowly and quickly, and perform aerial attacks. Each of these actions has very specific movements that are quite unintuitive for a new player. Make no mistake, it's going to take some time to get used to this, and you're going to make loads of mistakes in the process. I fully admit, of all Quintet's games, ActRaiser 2 is by far my least favorite. I admit, even though I like action platformers, I'm far from an expert at them. And ActRaiser 2 oftentimes felt so punishingly difficult that any enjoyment quickly turned to frustration. Furthermore, the lack of a god sim mode, and the seeming abandonment of indeed any sort of narrative aside from the absolute essentials, honestly made it feel like the least quintet-like game in their entire catalog. It just feels like a normal action platformer. A well-made action platformer in spite of its insane difficulty, but a normal one nonetheless. I'm not the only one who feels this way. 
Most fans, when given the choice, rank the original ActRaiser above its successor, and its sales numbers certainly reflect that. In the US, while it did perform better than it did in Japan, it still sold 80,000 units less than the original, casting real doubt on Enix's views that American gamers were only looking for action and challenge. Those numbers may be disappointing, but they were nothing compared to how it did in Japan, where it sold a tenth, yes, a tenth, of the numbers of the original ActRaiser. While it's technically unfair to call it a bad game, in terms of both commercial viability and audience popularity, it's hard to consider ActRaiser 2 as anything but a failure. Despite this, there are two aspects of the game that, deservedly so, have earned universal praise – its music and its graphics. Yuzo Koshiro returned to compose, and though the final soundtrack ran to only about 22 minutes, he made every one of those 22 minutes count. A couple tracks from the original return as rearranged versions, while the rest of the soundtrack retains a grandeur and majesty even beyond that of its predecessor. Koshiro's work, as usual, is untouchable. One only wishes he was able to make more of it. As for the graphics, they coincidentally come courtesy of another Koshiro, Yuzo's sister Ayano. Without exaggeration, the game is one of the most beautiful on the SNES, and represents a quantum leap forward for the presentation of Quintet's games. Its environments draw heavily from the game's two biggest sources of inspiration, Dante's Divine Comedy and Milton's Paradise Lost, resulting in levels that look straight out of a Renaissance painting. I liked how Soul Blazer and the original ActRaiser looked, but put it next to ActRaiser 2 and there's almost no point in comparing them, the difference is that great. The fact that Quintet was able to make their games look this much better in a little over a year is nothing short of astonishing. ActRaiser 2 may have been somewhat of a mixed bag, but its strengths still make it worthy to be replayed, as long as you know exactly what you're getting yourself into. Thankfully, their next game needs none of the qualifications reserved for this one. It would be the worthy follow-up to Soul Blazer action RPG fans were looking for. After Soul Blazer was finished, Quintet initially wanted to make a Soul Blazer 2. This wasn't going to be like ActRaiser 2, with its uncertain continuity, but a legitimate sequel. However, at some point early in development, Soul Blazer 2 was abandoned. This decision, according to an interview with graphic artist Koji Yokota, came from Enix of Japan, who instead wanted to publish something with more of a hook. This undoubtedly came from a desire to increase sales, as Soul Blazer sold only about half as well as the original ActRaiser did. What this hook was exactly supposed to be, Yokota didn't say, but as part of their strategy, Enix brought in both a celebrity artist and a celebrity writer to give their new game more prestige. The celebrity artist was manga artist Moto Hagio. This isn't a name that's super familiar to fans outside Japan, but Hagio is one of the most influential and important manga artists who ever lived. As part of the Showa 24 group, Hagio's manga, including the Poe Clan, Heart of Thomas, and many other beautifully designed hardcover books that are currently sitting on my shelf, helped raise the quality of storytelling in girls' manga to that of high literature, forever changing the medium in the process. Given that accomplishment, it's interesting that Hagio is also not tapped for a writing role, given that much of her output is in the science fiction or fantasy genres. Instead, Enix chose sci-fi writer Mariko Ohara. Unfortunately, I can't speak much of Ohara's work, given that I haven't read any of it, but in Japan she's certainly held in high esteem. Her novel Hybrid Child is particularly valued, winning the 1991 Seiyun Award, the Japanese equivalent to the Hugo. Tomoyoshi Miyazaki, Quintet's resident scenario writer, took the ideas Ohara crafted and combined them with what he had already created for Soul Blazer 2, the result being... If there's one game in Quintet's oeuvre that rivals ActRaiser as their best-known work, Illusion of Gaia would be it. Not only is it their best-selling, edging out ActRaiser by 50,000 units, but also, at least from my observations, it seems to be the most widely and fondly remembered, at least in the West. This is perhaps due to the fact that it's the only one of Quintet's games that was, outside of Japan, published by Nintendo directly, and as such, benefited from their marketing machine. But even if that wasn't the case, Illusion of Gaia would probably still be well remembered, because, even for Quintet, this is kind of a weird game, for good, and admittedly in some cases, for not so good. Unlike ActRaiser and Soul Blazer, Illusion of Gaia tells more of a definite story with predefined characters. The world, so says the opening text crawl, 
is in the midst of an age of exploration, with adventurers venturing into the ruins of ancient cultures. In the midst of this era of exploration is a teenage boy named Will, who more or less checks most of the important boxes of the Joseph Campbell Hero's Journey protagonist checklist. He's living a relatively average, boring life in the little town of South Cape. His father, one of those adventurers I just mentioned, vanished without a trace while exploring the Tower of Babel years ago. Despite this, Will seems to be living a decent life with his grandparents, going to school and spending his free time hanging out with his friends in their seaside cave. Oh yeah, Will also happens to have psychic powers, but even this doesn't appear to be the portent of anything world-changing right now. He really only uses it to perform parlor tricks for his friends. Anyway, one day his life turns upside down when he comes home to find a strange girl rummaging around his house. Turns out, this girl is Kara, the daughter of the local King Edward. Soldiers eventually escort her back to the castle, while Will is ordered to bring some sort of crystal ring to the king, even though he has no idea what this crystal ring is. He goes to the castle anyway and finds Kara again, who tells him that, ominously, her parents seem to be acting weird and have hired some mysterious mercenary named the Jackal to do their bidding. This ominous atmosphere is seemingly confirmed when the king throws Will in prison because he thinks Will is lying about the crystal ring. In prison, Will hears the voice of his father from his flute, who tells him to break out of prison, travel to the ancient ruins, and find the six mystic statues in order to save the world from evil. Yeah, as you can see, once the story gets going, it gets going, and it does not stop. I have to give the game credit for this. More than any other RPG of its era, Illusion of Gaia has nothing that can be considered filler. Unlike Actraiser or Soul Blazer, which have limited open-ended designs, Illusion of Gaia is laser-focused on progressing through its main story. This, of course, means the game is very, very linear. All you're able to do is progress to the next main story beat. You can't even explore the world map. The characters move to the next areas automatically without any opportunity to backtrack. There aren't even any side quests to speak of, with one major exception. The opportunity to collect up to 50 red jewels that you can trade to a shady guy named Jeweler Gem for a series of rewards, including, after you collect all 50, access to a bonus dungeon. If you've ever played The Legend of Dragoon, it's more or less similar to collecting the Stardust. Anyway, this excessive linearity is probably a turnoff for some, but not for me. As I've mentioned elsewhere, linearity in video games doesn't inherently bother me. There's enough variation between combat, exploration, and atmosphere that the game never felt monotonous and the story was unpredictable enough such that I was always highly anticipating what Quintet was going to do next. We'll get more in depth into the story in just a bit, but for right now, I want to discuss the presentation. As has become a signature of the studio, Quintet once again delivered a series of unbelievably diverse and beautiful environments to explore, arguably the most diverse in their catalog thus far. Adding to the charm is that the world is modeled after our own, with many of the ancient ruins being drawn directly from our history. You'll explore, just to name a few, ancient Inca ruins, Angkor Wat, the Great Wall of China, and even the Great Pyramids. And, it goes without saying, they all look gorgeous. Actraiser 2 proved that Quintet should not be underestimated when it comes to their graphics, and Illusion of Gaia more than carries on that legacy. Similarly, the music, as should also be expected of Quintet, is fantastic. The composer this time is Yasuhiro Kawasaki, an obscure figure given that many of the games on his resume never ended up leaving Japan, but some fans may know him for his work on the Zoids franchise. His soundtrack alternates between relaxing tracks for the towns, more rousing ones for the ruins, and plenty of others oozing mystery and intrigue, and Kawasaki excels at all of them. One must also applaud his heavy use of wind instruments, which not only complements the atmosphere of the game's world, but is even more fitting considering that Will not only plays the flute, but uses it in combat as well. And with that being said, now is a good time to transition to the combat system. Now, in my Soul Blazer video, I admitted that, despite its combat system being rather simple, I enjoyed it, as the game seems to have been designed around the player exploiting enemy patterns to make quick work of them. Though I stand by this, Illusion of Gaia's combat is, 
by comparison, technically superior in every way. Instead of having two basic methods of attacking, you have multiple different attacks that can be chained together into combos. Further, Will has the ability, by accessing the various dark spaces scattered throughout the game, to transform into different forms, namely the Dark Knight Freedan and the powerful Shadow. Each form has unique strengths that make them ideally suited for different environments and situations. For instance, Will can move a lot faster, but Freedan is more powerful and has a longer reach. To add to that, each form also has unique abilities that make switching between them a necessity in order to progress through most dungeons. Will, for instance, can slide through small holes in the wall, and Freedan cannot. This adds another dimension to exploration, which has already benefited from designs that demand you pay attention in order to progress. The Sky Garden is the most prominent example of this. You have to explore it both right side up and upside down, with what you do in one often having a residual impact on the other. I fully admit that when I played through this section of the game, I didn't pay as close attention as I should have, and as a result it took me far longer than I needed to, but I own up to the fact that that was my own fault. Many of the games have this sort of design to them, and I applaud that. The one negative aspect I found is that there are some dungeons, the Vampire Palace being the most infamous, that are basically vertical mazes, requiring you to enter a series of identical looking doors to progress through identical looking hallways. It was a bit too much, honestly, but aside from that, combat and dungeon exploration in this game is a joy. Before I forget, though, I need to mention one final thing about combat, and that's the unique progression system. Unlike the vast majority of RPGs, Illusion of Gaia does not use a traditional experience point based progression system. In each area, there are a set number of enemies, and after defeating a certain number of those enemies, you'll gain a stat boost. Think of it as like Soul Blazer, but instead of being rewarded by restoring a portion of the world, your character becomes more powerful. And also like Soul Blazer, once you kill an enemy, they stay dead, basically negating your need to grind. Although, this does mean that you'll have to do a lot of backtracking through completely deserted dungeons. This game really could have benefited from perhaps just fading to black once a dungeon is clear. But yes, getting back on track, the entire progression system plays out like this. Even your new abilities are granted in somewhat of a similar way, only instead of having to kill enemies, you're occasionally gifted them from the Earth Spirit Gaia when you enter a dark space. I can't think of another RPG with a progression system that feels quite like this one, and I like that. It provides powerful incentive to defeat every enemy you see, and it retains Quintet's philosophy of accessibility. Alright, now that we've covered most of the gameplay mechanics, it's time to return to the story. We've touched upon the story a bit already, but there's much more that needs to be said. Like I said earlier in this video, this is a weird game, both for better and for worse, and the story is where much of that weirdness comes from. I'm going to start with the negatives. To be brief, Illusion of Gaia seems to be deadlocked in a struggle between the story it's trying to tell with its characters and the atmosphere it wants to portray in its world. To better explain what I'm talking about, I'm once again going to compare it to its predecessor, Soul Blazer. Both the world and characters of Soul Blazer are mostly static, though the point of the game is to save the world, that world, once it's restored, is not one that's portrayed as needing change beyond being allowed to exist undisturbed by death toll. The characters, though there are a couple exceptions like Dr. Leo and King Magrid, remain similarly unchanged. I'm not suggesting that this is a bad thing. On the contrary, it's appropriate for the kind of game Soul Blazer was designed to be. Contrast this with Illusion of Gaia. From the opening scene, the game utilizes standard coming-of-age tropes. O'Hara herself admitted that one of her biggest influences when writing the game was the movie Stand By Me, arguably the quintessential coming-of-age film. In addition, the game is open about one of its themes being the evolution of life on Earth. I haven't mentioned this yet, but you eventually learn that the evil force you're trying to stop is a massive comet imbued with evil energy. Hundreds of years ago, when the comet came close to Earth, it screwed up the planet's natural evolution, and it's poised to do something similar this time around. All this points to a story that should, above all else, be focused on change. That being the case, it's very weird that the world of Illusion of Gaia feels almost as static as that of Soul Blazer. I'll give perhaps the most extreme example. One of the other major themes Illusion of Gaia seems to stress is that of the exploitation of vulnerable people. Again and again, you will encounter characters who are down on their luck and living a horrible, destitute existence. The English script refers to these people as laborers, but make no mistake, they're slaves. 
Quintet deserves commendation for their willingness to tackle this issue. There's one scene in particular where a group of slaves lament that they can no longer speak in their own language, having been forced to adopt the tongue of their oppressors to survive, which is a perspective I don't think I've seen in any other game I've ever played. That being said, it's weird that even after you learn about the atrocities of the slave situation, the game does not focus on fixing it. You do end up saving a group who have been forced to work in a diamond mine, but clearly they're not the only one in this predicament. This is a worldwide problem, and one Will is not going to take the time to solve. Will's entire journey is focused almost exclusively on collecting the six statues and stopping the comet. Everything else that happens is basically a means to that end. It's fine for the game to know where its focus lies, but I would argue that it would have been possible to focus on stopping the comet while also taking an active interest in fixing the world's issues. As evidence of that, I'll mention Chrono Trigger. Not only because it's a game I'm certain everyone watching this has already played at least once, but it's also, like Illusion of Gaia, a game where a group of young people have to stop a calamity from the skies from ravaging the world while simultaneously exploring that world and fixing its problems. Destroying Lavos may be the most important goal, but you're also tasked with, for instance, rescuing Guardia from the machinations of the evil Chancellor, defeating a savage group of Reptites, among many others. And at no point do these tasks feel like they're just being tacked on. They feel as important as any other. If there's another game on the Super Nintendo, besides Illusion of Gaia, that's rightly earned an all-killer, no-filler reputation, it's Chrono Trigger. Unfortunately, Illusion of Gaia's focus on the evil comet does make everything else feel like added flavor, as opposed to an integral component of the narrative. It's such a dominant force that it directly contributes to one of the other bizarre aspects of the game. Aside from that comet, there aren't really any villains in this story. I mean, there are the people who keep the slaves, of course, but what I'm saying is there's no other villainous force that opposes you throughout your journey, no one for you to struggle with, no antagonist in the literal sense of that word. The bosses you fight are mostly just guardians of the ruins you're exploring, who don't play any other greater role in the narrative. Even King Edward, who Kara worries has grown tyrannical at the start of the story, does not appear at all after throwing Will in prison. The only other person who could maybe qualify as a villain is the Jackal, the mercenary who was hired by Kara's parents, but even he doesn't actually appear in person until close to the end of the game. He's mostly just this evil specter that continually follows you throughout your journey. So is there any dynamism to be found in this story? Of course there is. Every one of the main characters, Will and the friends who follow him, has their own character arc. They're pretty basic, to be sure, but they're there nonetheless. Lance, one of Will's friends, discovers his father living in another town, stricken with dementia. In response, he decides to venture to the Great Wall of China to find a cure, and later settles down in that town along with his newfound love interest, Lily. Kara, who starts the game as a spoiled princess, learns to be more humble. These narratives aren't super deep, and they're sort of thrown about all over the game, but they're not bad, and they do well to reinforce Illusion of Gaia's dedication to the theme of the necessity of evolution and change. Given that the game's narrative never felt 100% cohesive, it makes sense that my favorite parts of the story weren't necessarily the overarching plot, but in shorter, individual moments that allowed Quintet's genius to shine through despite the story's lack of cohesion. And I don't think anything illustrates what I'm talking about better than the famous scene with Hamlet the Pig. Hamlet is introduced way back in South Cape as Kara's pet, and he continues to make brief cameos off and on as the game progresses. The player is never given any sort of indication that Hamlet is going to be anything more than this pseudo-mascot. This all changes, however, during one late game scene, where Will, Kara, and their friends are captured by a tribe of starving natives. The English localization covers this up, but the Japanese script makes it clear that the natives are going to eat you, although this admittedly isn't hard to piece together just from the context clues in the English version either. Before this happens, though, Hamlet rushes into the scene and throws himself in the fire, for, as the game says, one baby pig can save many villagers. The scene is simultaneously both shocking and moving, made even more powerful by the fact that it's a callback to another powerful scene from earlier in the game. The scene I'm referring to is the one where Will and Kara are stranded on a raft at sea, which, setting aside what I'm about to discuss here, has always been a scene I've held close to my heart. 
True, you don't really do anything aside from wait and occasionally talk to Kara, but it was an effective way of portraying the dread and loneliness of spending a month drifting through unknown waters not knowing whether or not you'll ever be rescued. Anyway, as part of this scene, Will catches some fish so they can eat. Kara, at first, refuses to eat them. She doesn't want to take the life of any other living thing, even if it means starving herself to do it. But as the days crawl by, hunger inevitably gets the better of her, and she eats the fish with Will. I love the ambivalence here. Her decision isn't framed as heroic or anything close to positive. It's simply necessary if she's able to survive. Hamlet's sacrifice can be seen as a variation on that scene. By cooking himself, he's able to prevent the starvation of the villagers, and even though he'll lose his life to make that happen, in his mind, it's the right thing to do. Again, survival comes hand in hand with sacrifice, and even animals are cognizant of that fact. As such, the game once again recalls Soul Blazer, specifically the scene in Dr. Leo's lab where he can speak to a cat. He says that cats don't actually like killing rats, but if they didn't kill rats, they wouldn't be able to survive. It's a complex web of emotions Quintet is evoking here. Sadness at the inevitability of death, happiness at the prolonged continuation of life, sorrow at the inescapability of sacrifice to make that happen. Again, for a Super Nintendo game, this is very sophisticated. Hell, even George Wood, of all people, is aware enough to recognize that. Illusion of Gaia, one of the best stories ever for a video game. Someone please turn this into a movie. Be forewarned, the pig sacrifices a shocking dramatic twist. I mean, he didn't have to give away the twist there, but I guess good on him for acknowledging the scene at all. So even though I think Illusion of Gaia suffers from an incohesive narrative, it's moments like these that make me unable to dismiss it outright. There are a lot of these memorable scenes, and not all of them are as emotionally draining as Hamlet's sacrifice. Some are just moments where Will and his friends are having fun or exploring some new locale. Maybe it doesn't tie into anything, but as far as establishing the atmosphere of growing up, it's unmatched. Nonetheless, the emotional scenes are the ones that are going to stick with you the most, and another of those moments is the game's ending. I'm not going to discuss the ending note for note, nor am I going to go deep into the lore-related revelations you discovered therein, as, to be frank, I don't think it's that interesting. Suffice it to say, Will and Kara are able to destroy the comet. Because the comet no longer has any influence on the evolution of the planet, Earth will return to the state it was always intended to take. As a result of that, however, Will, Kara, and all of their friends will be separated, reborn into this new world with all their memories erased. It will be as if their entire adventure never took place at all. Now, right at first, I have to dock points for the fact that Will and Kara are apparently in love. I mentioned in my Soul Blazer review that Miyazaki isn't particularly great at writing female characters, but beyond even that, he's specifically not that great at writing romances. It feels like Will and Kara are in love not because of anything organic that happened between them, but because they're the protagonists and that's what they're supposed to do. Call it the Star Wars prequel trilogy philosophy of romance, I guess. You're so... beautiful. <laughs> only because I'm so in love. No. <laughs> no, it's because I'm so in love with you. <laughs> but really, the romance doesn't even need to exist for the ending to have the power it does. Beyond apparently being lovers, Will and Kara are friends first, and they're now painfully aware that they're probably never going to see each other, or any of their mutual friends, ever again. For as much as I criticize the narrative of being disjointed, this ending does neatly bring together Illusion of Gaia's emphases on the growth of both the individual and the world. Just as it's necessary for the world to change to improve, so is it necessary for the individual to change to improve. Part of this means leaving old things behind, and in the case of the individual, it means saying goodbye to your friends. Not because they're no longer your friends, but because your lives are progressing down different paths. I mean, we've already seen this on a micro level. Lance and Lily are going to settle down with Lance's father. They're not going to be around to play with in South Cape anymore. Like so much else in Quintet's work, it's necessary but painful, and both Will and Kara are aware of this. I'm just going to leave their parting words here to drive my point home. Will, come here. Show me your face. I want to burn you into my memory. Don't worry, I will search you out, no matter how long it takes. Hundreds of years, thousands of years, I will come to you. If you can read these words without feeling anything, then you have a heart of stone. 
The game's final scene seems to suggest that Will and Kara's wishes will, one day, come true. In what appears to be a modern city, Will leaves school, and seems to meet up with the new versions of his friends. Even if these new versions don't retain the memories of their adventure, the fact that they seem to have found each other in this new world means that their friendship did, in fact, survive across space and time. And that, my friends, is Illusion of Gaia, a game that I wasn't necessarily intending to discuss for this long, but I suppose I had more to say about it than I thought. And who can blame me? There was a lot to talk about, both good and bad. And now that I think about it, it's games like Illusion of Gaia that make me realize why I make the kind of videos that I do. I'm sure you've all noticed that I've never been the kind of person to give objective ratings to anything I talk about. To say, for instance, this game is an 8 out of 10, or this game gets 3 stars. Truth be told, I could never bring myself to do that. To me, criticism should be about nuance and subtlety, and an objective rating system completely destroys any semblance of nuance or subtlety. I mean, there were a number of things that I didn't like about Illusion of Gaia. Does that mean I should give it a 7 out of 10? A 6 out of 10? If I gave it that kind of rating, many of you would probably consider it average and just dismiss it outright, and that's the last thing I want you guys to do. The truth is, I love Illusion of Gaia. I know it's not perfect, but you know what? I don't care. I don't need the games I play to be perfect. I need them to be memorable, and Illusion of Gaia is nothing if not memorable. Sure, I wish its narrative was a bit more cohesive. Sure, I wish Will took a bit more active role in fixing the world's problems. But all these issues take nothing away from the fact that Illusion of Gaia is a game filled with a non-stop sense of adventure, memorable characters, and moments of profound beauty and heartache. Illusion of Gaia may not be the greatest action RPG I've ever played, but it's absolutely one of my favorites. Thank you.